So hello everyone, Shabbat Shalom, um, Natan Lawrence, Hoshana Rabbah, and today I'm going to be looking at my notes on my computer, and we want to go through the next parasha in the book of Vayikra or Leviticus, <clears throat> and um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because we have some other things we want to share today. So it's um, hello to everybody on YouTube, and also to those watching online in uh various states from the east coast to the west coast of the united states i don't see our international contingency here today but we pray, pray a blessing on everybody and we thank i just praise y'all for the, all the people that are faithful they're seeking him and wanting to serve and obey him in spirit and truth around the world y'all is raising up a remnant of people it's not a large number of people i don't know how large or how small it is but it's people who are being awakened to the truth, and I say truth with a capital T. There is only one truth with a capital T. All the other truth are small t truths. But there's one capital T truth, and that's the truth of Yehovah Elohim. Uh, the truth that is divinely revealed, that has never changed. And I don't care what anybody tells you in the church of your choice, wherever you may be going, there's only one truth. And may Yah bring us all into alignment with that truth. May he, may he bring us all in, a, in one accord together, uh, serving and obeying him in that truth. And as we search the scriptures, as we study them and move away from the traditions of men by which the word of Elohim has been made of none effect, as we lay aside the doctrines of men, and the things that do not line up with the word of Elohim from Genesis to Revelation, we will be coming into the unity of the faith. We will be coming closer to Elohim through Yeshua the Messiah. We will be growing in grace and knowledge in the fullness and the stature of Yeshua the Messiah. And as we lay aside our sin, our carnality, and all the things in our lives that are incongruent, to the word, to the spirit, and to the will, and to the truth, capital T, truth of Elohim, we will be coming into unity. And that is the that is the one body of Yeshua. And it has nothing to do with denominational names, labels, titles, or any of that kind of thing. It has to do with the spirit, the spirit of truth. So today, um, and that's why we... We want to teach about these things, and uh, in the Scripture, the whole counsel of His Word. We're going to start back in the in the Torah, and we're going to later, a little bit later, for the second teaching, we're going to end up in the Book of Revelation. So today is Shemini, a parasha, a Torah portion of Shemini, and it starts in Vaikra or Leviticus chapter nine, verse one, and it goes through the end of chapter eleven, covers three chapters. And there's some really neat nuggets, some really neat pearls in this. So I'm just going to go through this with open Bible. I've got my Bible open here in front of me. And I also have my computer with my, my Torah commentary in front of me. So I kind of keep me on track. And I'd like to first call our attention actually to the last um, several verses of chapter 8 in Leviticus. So we have the... Levitical priesthood under the leadership of Moses and Aaron being consecrated. They have the tabernacle has been set up. The tabernacle of Moshe or Moses has been set up. And the the priests have been, the, the Levites as well as the, the priests who were of the descendants of Aaron, Aharon, uh, had been consecrated, anointed. They'd gone through the seven steps. They had been um, of consecration which we've talked about in the past. Those are actually the seven steps that every one of us must go through to become saved and to become a child of Elohim. You know, there's so much beautiful truth in these scriptures. And again, you know, I, I say this again and again, and I'm going to keep saying it. Why has the Christian church let this stuff go? Why has the Christian church, and I'm talking about the leaders, whether a, it's a pope, or a cardinal, or a bishop, or a reverend, or a, or a denominational head, or whether it's a professor in a seminary, or a Bible college, or a pastor in the pulpit, or, or a Bible teacher in a Sunday school, or wherever. Why have they let these truths go? You know, 
part of me, I just, my head just spins in incredulity at the fact that these things are not taught. Or so they're taught in a very minor way. And part of me also, it's righteous indignation. I have great animus against and righteous indignation against the leaders, just like Yeshua had, against the leaders who claim to be Bible teachers, who claim to know the truth and are leading the sheeple, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, and I, I also speak to the, to the, um, the, the Jewish sages who call themselves rabbis, illegitimately so. Yeshua said to call no man rabbi. And, and, and yet they have done that. They have gone against the teachings of the true rabbi, the true great one, the true great one teacher. That's Yeshua the Messiah. And so I have great anger, anger against these, these individuals who are, it's the blind leading the blind. And so he has revealed, and, and people are coming out of that blindness, but billions of people across the face of the earth are still trapped in, in, in these systems, these money-grubbing, money-making systems where these, these leaders sit at the top of these denominations and these churches, raking in millions and billions of dollars and living their lifestyles and, you know, and, and, and being more concerned about the praises of men than the praises of Elohim. Okay, so enough on that. I'm going to keep beating that drum. But the bottom line is there are so many wonderful truths in the, in the Torah and throughout the whole Bible. And we really do not fully understand the Bible unless we understand the Torah. The first five books, which is the foundation. So here we read in Leviticus chapter 8, the end of the chapter. It says in verse 33, Leviticus chapter 8, and you shall not go outside the door of the tabernacle of meeting for seven days until the days of your consecration are ended. For seven days ye, ye, he shall consecrate you, and, and as he has done this, so the Lord, Jehovah has commanded you to do to make atonement for you. And you shall stay at, the, verse 35, you shall stay at the door of the tabernacle of meeting and day and night for seven days. So here they were. They had to camp there um, at the door of the tabernacle. So right by the altar of sacrifice. They could not go in any further. Uh, for seven days and keep the charge of Jehovah so that you may not die. For so I have commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all the things that Jehovah had commanded by the hand of Moses. And then we get into chapter 9 verse 1. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel and said to Aaron, take a bull, uh, take for yourself a young bull and so forth. So what does this teach us? I could go in several different directions at this point. Hello, Janelle. Good to see you. Um, oh, and, sorry, and, I'm late. Yeah, no, no, no apologies. We just got started and, and good to see. I take it to... Um, uh, Kennedy's in the background there somewhere. But anyway, um, what does this teach us? That Moses, that Yah required Moses, uh, that is the Lee, Aaron and his sons to camp outside the, well, right inside the door of the tabernacle. They'd already been consecrated, so they'd already been saved. But they could not go in any further, any further until they spent seven days. Imagine camping Let's say in your backyard for seven days in a tent, and you couldn't go any further from that. What would you be doing? You had no iPhone or electronic device. You're just sitting there. What would you be thinking about? What would you be doing? Well, um, needless to say, they had a lot of time to think. They were getting ready to start the ministry of the tabernacle, and everything, all the sacrifices, the offerings, all the temple Tabernacle service. Um, I'm sure there was great anticipation. But there was also fear. Because they didn't want to step out of line lest they die. 
and they could not go any further unless, except that Yah said, unless, you know, if you do, you will die. This was a very, very solemn, fearsome thing. And sadly, this, before they could come into the presence of Elohim, and sadly, this is something that has been lost in the church, in the evangelical church. Come as you are. Just as you are. And I get the point. We can come as we are. But we cannot come into the presence of Elohim just as we are. With all of our sin. With our sexual perversions. With our transgenderism. With our, our uncleanness and our profanity. Because Elohim is high and lifted up. And he is set apart. He is holy. And if we bring our sin and our sinfulness and our sinful mentalities and mindsets and lifestyles into the presence of Elohim, and we have not made proper atonement and come under the blood and repented, made teshuvah, it is a death sentence. Make no mistake about it. And this is something that the church does not teach. Let's put this way, the evangelical church. Now, I will give credit to the mainline churches. I don't know how many of you have gotten to travel, but I've traveled in 20, over 20 countries, I think 22, and four different continents over the last 40 years. I've lived overseas when I was in college for, for, a, a, for a, a, an academic year. And during that time and subsequently, I've gotten a chance to travel. And I've been in the largest, most famous cathedrals in the world. In France, England, Italy, and other places. Switzerland, um, and in New York City. And I'll tell you, when you start, step into one of these thousand-year-old Gothic cathedrals like Notre Dame in Paris or St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and I'm not a Catholic, and I have no, and I, my, my family has no Catholic background, but when you step into one of these things, or St. Peter's, I mean, St. Mark's in Venice or, or the b big basilica in, um, in Florence or, or um, Sacre-Cœur in France, which, which my wife were there, we were there about two and a half, three years ago. Or Westminster Abbey in London, or some of the other cathedrals, or even um, the big one in I think St. John's Divine or whatever it's called in New York City. You know, when you step where you could put the, literally put the Statue of Liberty inside of that one, it's so big. There's a sense of awe. I, I don't know if it's because of the building, probably largely because of the building itself and the architecture and the, the grandeur. But when you step into that, there is a sense of awe, like you're coming into the presence of something. And I know it's a lot of religiosity, but it is it, it leaves you with your mouth hanging open when you step, step into some of these places. I don't know if any of you have experienced that, but I have. And that is something that the evangelical church has lost I, in, my, in, my, in my experience. And, you know, the, the mainline churches have a lot of costumes and razzmatazz and rituals. And it does cause one to kind of stop and think and slow down. And in a sense, they have lost or they have, they have kept some of that magnificence. I'm not into all that stuff, but there's something there. And that's exactly what Moses and Aaron and his sons, they had to stop before coming into the presence of Elohim and walk slowly. And when you come to these big cathedrals, they, they say, turn your cell phones off, be quiet, speak in a, in a quiet voice, or don't talk and respect people that might be in there praying. Um, some of them don't even allow you to take pictures, like in, in Westminster Abbey um, in um, London. Uh, we were there a couple, two and a half years, almost three years ago, and, and toured through that. And we, they did not allow you to take even photographs. That's how sacred they view it is, view it as being. And I think we need to really stop and think about these things and understand the fear of Yehovah. 
And I, I suspect that Moses and, and Aaron and his sons, they had a lot to think about for a week. They had to come in under the blood. Atonement had to be made. And before they went in even any further, the atonement had to be made again. What does this tell us? The gravity of sin. Yah places a great emphasis on sin. And it has to be dealt with. And this is this is nothing new to you. You you people already know this. So I'm preaching to the choir. So what I want to focus on, and and I think the church has a has a good you know a somewhat of a concept of the importance of sin, but the holiness of Elohim, how far above the earthly plane that He is. It says here in Ecclesiastes. Chapter, I think it's chapter 5. Let me turn there real quickly. And I see this as kind of a corollary. Verse 1, Ecclesiastes 5, 1. Walk prudently when you go to the house of Elohim, and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let your heart utter anything hastily before Elohim. For Elohim is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. You know, I spent quite a few years in the charismatic Pentecostal type churches. And many of you come from those kind of backgrounds. And one thing when I was pastoring Elim, we, we didn't just rush in. We came in quietly. Um, for many years, we had a hand-washing ceremony symbolizing coming in and being pure. And we'd start out with quiet prayer and quiet worship, and then we'd move into praise. But I've been in many churches because we wanted to come in quietly and reverently and then enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise and come in. And as we're washing our hands in the water-pouring ceremony, thinking about the necessity to get clean hands and a pure heart. And, but how many of you have been in churches where as soon as the praise and worship starts, it's like somebody flips on a light switch and all of a sudden we slip into our, our um, praise and worship mode and everybody throws their hands up and starts blathering in tongues or singing. And it's just like, and then as soon as it's, I mean, it's just like, it's just like a switch is flipped on. And and five minutes earlier, they were arguing with their wife in the car as they're driving up to the church. <laughs> okay, you know what I mean? It's like, no, let's go quietly and let's go prayerfully and let's go respectfully. In fact, for the first, last many years, I drove separately from in my own vehicle. as I We lived 15 minutes away from the church. And I drove separately in my own vehicle away from my family just so I could stay because I had been praying all morning before I went into our congregation. I got up early before the kids, usually, you know, six, seven o'clock in the morning, earlier than, you know, than, than them. And I come into my office and pray, prepare my teaching and get in that mindset. And I wouldn't want anything to disrupt that. I wouldn't want to get in an argument with my wife over some stupid thing or, you know, have to correct my children. So I would come in separately just so I could stay in a mindset of worship and praise. So, you know, th I did that for many years. People probably wondered why I did. Well, now I'm telling you the truth. I mean, that's why I did. I wanted to stay in that mindset. And so um, I think you can understand what I'm saying. So they 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 sat out they sat outside there for seven days. Seven is a number biblical number of completion or perfection, and they had to get themselves situated spiritually and mentally and and psychologically and emotionally. And then verse nine says, on the eighth day, eight after they had completed this this consecration process. Then they could go in. Eight is a biblical number of new beginnings. Now they could enter from the physical realm into the spiritual realm and begin to come into the presence of Elohim. So the reason I point this out is when we are coming into our own 
prayer time, our own devotion time, or we're meeting with people, let's do it very thoughtfully and very carefully, recognizing who we're coming before. And it says here in verse 4, after sacrifices were made, again, we've got to stay under the blood of Yeshua all the time. Today, Yehovah will appear to you. And then in verse 6, and then Moses said, this is the thing which Yehovah commanded you to do. And the glory of Yehovah will appear to you. And then we have more sin offerings being offered. I mean, if, if, he, if Yah is not emphasizing the importance of getting dealing with sin in order to come into a right place with him, because he is holy, he is set apart, he is kadosh, and that we are not, and we got to deal with it. I mean, if, if this isn't being emphasized, I don't know what is. But he says, if you do all of these things and you follow my protocols, pardon me, he goes, my glory will appear. What is his glory? Well, it's the Hebrew word kavod, or kavod, depending on the grammar. And it literally means his weighty, his glorious presence. So basically, when we follow the proper protocols, he will dwell among his people. His presence will manifest itself. Now, there's many, many ways that his presence manifests itself. And, and I think naturally we think about, you know, um, all kinds of supernatural um, manifestations of one kind or another. And many of us have experienced some of those things. Um, one time I sat down and I kind of cataloged in my mind all the different types of anointings that I have personally experienced. And there's about nine of them. Different anointings, different where I sensed his presence, where I felt it in my body or in my, in, in my spirit. But I was thinking about that this morning and meditating on that. And when he says that you do what is right and you come into alignment with me, my way, through the blood of Yeshua, through a relationship with Yeshua. What does Yeshua promise? He promises he will send the Parakletas, the Comforter, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. In his final discussion with his disciples before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and then to the cross. And you'll find that in Romans or John uh, 4, 14, 15, and 16. And what would the Ruach do? He said the Ruach, basically four things. The Ruach will lead you into all truth, will tell you, reveal to you things to come, will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and recall to you the things I have told you. Those four things. I have those marked in my Bible. That was a promise. So at the very least, he promises to send his spirit to do those things to you so that when you open up the Bible, his presence will be there to reveal to you things out of the Bible, to reveal to you things that are, are going to come. We are, we're going to talk about this in, in the second teaching, but he, he said we're not children of the darkness, but we're children of the light. There in First, in, uh, first Thessalonians 5. We're, we're children of the light. We know the times and the seasons. We're not like those who crowds in the darkness getting drunk. And drunkenness is a, is a well, we're going to talk about that here in a little bit with regard to Nadab and Abihu. But drunkenness is a sign of spiritual fornication. It's getting drunk on the things of this world. So that we are now dull to the things of Elohim. Boy, if there weren't a time when we need to be alert and totally focused on Him with all the things going on in the world today, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm 62, and I've lived a fairly long life, and we've got people here that are in their 80s, 70s and 80s, and you can probably say that we've never been in such crazy times. I mean, World War II was pretty bad, but and the Great Depression, and some of you were born um, during that time. But but we are we are on the cusp of some major prophecies in the Bible being fulfilled. Uh, you know, we talk about in the book of Revelation. 
And so this gives us great pause for reflection and consideration. This is time to really take stock of our lives. Okay, so let's move along here. So we really do need the presence of Elohim. And we need him to reveal us to us things that were going to come and give us the scriptures that we need to stand on in these end times. So that we will not be buffeted, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and all the voices that are out there. There's a lot of voices, especially now with the internet. I mean, everybody's got an opinion. Uh, and there's all kinds of information coming at us from all different directions. And we need to be able to separate the holy from the profane. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, too. We need discernment. Otherwise, we could become confused and lost, just like the people in the world. And that's why, like I, I said in the beginning, our beginning comments, I'm doing everything I can when I meet people. And I'm asking y'all, like almost every day, bring people across my path and put the words in my mouth to say to people, to point them towards you. I don't know if they're saved or not, if they have a relationship with the issue, if they even know, you know, they even have a Bible, but I'm pointing people in that direction. I try to do it, you know, one or two or three times a day, uh, depending on where I'm at and who I'm talking to. This is, I think we all need to be doing this. And I, as the more I do it, the better I'm getting. The more I push myself out there and the more I, you know, I'm, I'm becoming bolder. You all know what I'm talking about? You know, practice makes perfect. And as and he will give us the things to say. So when heaven and earth meet, then the glory will appear. Yes, you may feel an anointing. Like I feel a tingling on my fingers right now. I don't always, but I feel like I, I feel an anointing on my hands right now as I'm speaking to you. Um, and that tells me when, you know, when I'm many times when I've been ministering, whether it's been in the prisons or on the streets or in the in the in the in the rehab centers, drug alcohol rehab centers in the past, or when I've been ministering in in the congregational setting, there'll be times when the anointing will come over my hands, and I know I've got to pray for people, and I can literally feel it flowing out like electricity. And some of you have experienced this, and that's just one thing, and that's His presence too. Or when you're worshiping and praising, and you just sense His presence. There's many many ways. That, that this can happen in many ways that, that he, he manifests himself. It may be just this shalom, this well-being that you sense inside your being. It may be when you open up the Bible and you just suddenly truth comes flying off and it, it's revelation. It may be all different kinds of things that happen in your life. But I'm just saying when heaven and earth line up, just expect things to happen. Expect things to line up. Expect him to direct your steps. Expect, expect, expect. And then thank him for it when it happens. He loves a grateful, thankful heart. And he will show up in the little things and he will show up in the big things. And ask him to give you the eyes to see and discernment to see his moving. So that you can then praise and worship him and thank him for and share your testimony. And, 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 and give him the glory. I, I had a chance to share my testimony. One of my clients is a retired doctor, a surgeon. And, and I was talking to him yesterday and I shared with him my miraculous healing of my ankle uh, when I came out of a tree 33 years ago. Oh no, 35 years ago now. Wow. And, and was crippled for three years. I had a, had a broken ankle and, and they grafted it back together twice. And the third time it wouldn't, it wouldn't, they wanted to graft it again, and I, I, I trusted Yah, and I received a miraculous healing. And this doctor, he's like in his, he's like 86. He knew the doctor, the surgeon that I that had worked on me. He said, "Oh, I knew him. We used to do surgeries together, <laughs> you know, way back." And and I shared with doc, this doctor Wagner, my client, um, you know, about how the Lord had healed me. And he's not, he's not a real believer. I mean, he. I think he believes, but he's not real. He's not real practicing. His wife is more devoted than he was, but you know, or more devoted than he is. But, but, I just gave it to him, and I've shared my testimony with hundreds of people. And, and all, even though it's been thirty-five years later, and you all have testimonies of healings and miraculous things. Ray, you've got a testimony that won't stop. And you, your, your healing confounded the doctors. And that just happened in the last few months. 
So you you know you go out there, share it with the ducks, share it with whatever you you know get practice, share it with the dogs, share it with the people that are coming in. You know when he gives you uh, opportunities, and I'm sure you are. But just I want to encourage you in that, and you never know the seed you might plant might make a difference. Okay, so now let's talk about holy fire. Fire, and then now we're going to move further into chapter nine. Well, let me, uh, end of chapter, let's just, before we move, end of chapter uh, twenty, chapter 9, it says, verse 22, Then Aaron lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them, and it came and came down from offering, the sin offering, there's another offering, you know, and God deal with the sin, sin offering, and, and he had a, then a peace offering. So once his sin offering is made, then shalom or peace comes with our Father in heaven. We've got to deal with sin, through the blood and the sacrifice of Yeshua, and then the peace, then reconciliation is made with Elohim. And like we talked about last week, then we can sit down and have a meal together. We can actually have a picnic together. We can actually hang out with our Father in heaven, you know, however that might be. And that's what the peace offering represents. Because peace has been made between heaven and earth. The sin has been dealt with. And now we can have a peaceful relationship with our Father in heaven. Verse 23, And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the kavod, then the glory of Jehovah appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before Jehovah and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. I'll tell you, when the presence of Elohim comes down in a very powerful way, you're on your face. You are on your face. Trust me. It's happened to me several times. When the kavod, when the weight of his glory comes down, you're flat on the ground and your mouth is shut and you're just worshiping him. And I've had the experience of, of that, that particular anointing uh, about three times in my life. And it, it is, you, you just, you don't say anything. It, you know what I'm talking about? If anybody's experienced that, raise their hand. Yeah, a couple of you have. Yeah, you just you just don't say anything. It's like this, you know, when you go to the dentist and they take X-rays and they put this this um, vest on you, this the lead. That's what it feels like, at least for me. When the kavod, remember the word kavod means the weight of his glory. Paul talks about the weight of his glory in one of his epistles, the weight of his glory. I think it was Paul. Maybe it was Peter. I don't remember. But anyway, I think he's talking about the kavod there. But when his presence comes down, it literally pushes you to the floor. I mean, you just, it doesn't force you, but you've got to get down. And you've got to get flat because you're in the presence of the Almighty. And it's, it's like this, 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 this vest on top of you. And it's not an oppressive thing. I've experienced three times the demonic, what I call the demonic anointing. It's in a dark wet oppression it's this is this is not like that that your head is clear and you just know you are in his presence and you've got to get low it's a beautiful that you you're on your face and that's what happened here and i pray if we need more of that we do because i'll tell you that's an awesome solemn moment and you know your place you know he is great and you are not great, and you're there by His grace. And um, so, anyway, um, it's a beautiful thing. Okay, so the fire came out. Fire in the Bible is um, represents light. It's a, it represents truth, but it's also judgment. Our Elohim is a consuming fire, as we've talked about before. Before fire refines. It refines the gold, silver, and precious stones, but also it purifies. I mean, it purifies and refines, but it also brings judgment against the wood, the hay, and the stubble. So if your life has wood, hay, and stubble, the judgments, the refinements, the truth, the light of Elohim is going to burn that out. So if you're walking with him, you're going to be, you're going to welcome the fire. You're going to welcome that. If you're not walking with him and you have something in your life, which is profane, it's going to, 
that light, that truth is going to bring judgment against you. Remember when Yeshua is coming, is coming back on a war stallion in, in Revelation 19. What's coming out of his mouth? A two-edged sword, which is the word. The word burns like a fire. It cuts between soul and spirit, between joint and moral, between holy and profane. It's going to separate out all the traditions of men, all the... The, the commandments of men by which the word of Elohim has been made of none effect, all the unbiblical stuff, it's going to cut that asunder. All the mental concepts, all the religiosity things that are unbiblical, it's going to, all the excuses why you couldn't obey Elohim, why you didn't want to make Yeshua the Lord of your life. On, on the, on, when he comes back and, and he brings that sword to bear upon the wicked, the wrath of Elohim upon the wicked of the earth, and brings down Babylon the Great, the New World Order, the Novus Ordo Seclorum uh, of the end times, the Antichrist system. But also, when everybody stands before him in, 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 on, the, on Judgment Day, he's going he's gonna, to, the books are going to be opened and there's going to be no more excuses. No more profane fire in the name of religion. So here we have chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu. We're flowing this all together. They offered up profane fire. What is profane and what is holy? How do you even know what is holy unless you know what Elohim has called is holy? Um, <laughs> human beings do not have, I don't care if you're the Pope or who, you do not have the prerogative or the authority to call something holy that Yah has not also called holy. There's all kinds of things that the church calls holy. Holy water, the Holy Mother, um, I have a whole list of them. I, I could go back and find it. There's all kinds of, maybe I'll go back there and see if I can come across that. All kinds of things that, that, that here it is. Oh, it's right here. Yeah, the Holy Cross, Holy Water, Mary, the Holy Mother of Jesus, Holy Sunday, the Christian Holidays, Holy, the Holy Sepulcher of Christ, the Holy Relics, the Holy See, as in the Vatican, um, the Holy Week, the Holy Mass, holy cities like Rome, Mecca, Medina, the Holy Grail, Holy Moly. <laughs> I don't know what a moly is, but um, <laughs> you ever heard of Holy Moly or Holy Guacamole? <laughs> I don't know how guacamole, I love guacamole, but I don't think it's holy. A holy cow? <laughs> that comes from Hinduism. No, you know, People can call anything they want holy. But that does not mean it's holy. There are certain things in the Bible, though, that the Bible calls holy. You look them up. The ground on which Jehovah is standing is holy ground. Exodus 3, verse 5. Joshua 5, 15. He said, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. The people of Israel are called holy. Exodus 19, verse 6, and Deuteronomy 14, 21, and so forth. Holy because they have been consecrated unto Elohim. And that refers to the saints. We are to walk in holiness and be holy as he is holy. The Sabbath is called holy. Not Sunday, not the first day of the week. The Sabbath. Exodus 16, 23, Exodus 20, verse 8. The garments that were worn by the high priests were called holy, Exodus 28, verse 2. And that's a picture of our robes of righteousness that Yeshua gives us when we get saved. And the offerings made on the altar are called holy, Leviticus 6, verse 18. Jehovah's feast days are called holy, called holy days, Leviticus 23, verse 2. The camp of Israel is called holy, 23, verse 14. That's why they had to boil, I mean, bury their excrement. He said, because I'm walking through the, the camp and I don't want to see anything that's profane or unholy. Heaven as the abode of Elohim is holy. Deuteronomy 26, 15. Yehovah Elohim himself is holy. Job 6, 10, Psalm 23, 22, 3, and so forth. Zion and Jerusalem are called holy. Um, the spirit of Elohim is holy. The Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. 
The name of Elo, the name of Yehovah is holy. Luke one forty nine. Yeshua is holy. Acts twenty two verse twenty seven and three fourteen. The prophets, Yehovah's prophets, are holy. Acts three twenty one. And I'm talking about the true prophets, not the people running around today in the church world claiming to be prophets. They are what the Bible calls, what I call, the carnal prophets. They are a mixture of the holy and the profane at the very best. And his Torah is holy. Um, 2 Peter 3.21 So those are some of the things that Elohim calls holy. You know, if we don't understand what the definition of holiness is, and we think water is holy, or the Pope is holy, or the cross is holy, or our church is holy, or Sunday is holy... Do you think that's not going to affect our thinking and our approach to Elohim and our understanding of scriptures when we don't even know what the difference um, between holy and profane is? So holy is that which is set apart, that which is pure, that which is set apart from that which is polluted or profane. That which is profane is defiled, is polluted. That's what the word profane means in the, in the Hebrew. And then we are called not here, but elsewhere. We are called to make a difference. Yehovah's people are called to make a difference between the holy and the profane. And uh, I'll pull those scriptures up later. Uh, that's like in Ezekiel and in, in several places there. But he's calling his people to teach the difference between the holy and the profane. And to know the difference and then to walk out the difference. When was the last time you heard in, the, in your Sunday church where, where a, a teaching was made on the difference between the holy and the profane using the scriptures I just gave you. I never heard one. They don't know. When you throw the Torah out, you don't know. You really, When you say, oh, the Sabbath has been done away with, the feasts have been done away with, the dietary laws have been done away with, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and all these things... You, you, you're lost as a goose in a snowstorm if you don't know what, what true holiness is. What Yah defines as holy. So, Nadab and Abihu offered up, up, offered up profane fire. The Bible doesn't say what the fire was, but it was not the proper fire that they were supposed to offer up. They were offering up, I guess, incense, but it must not have, the, the flames, it was not started off of the altar of sacrifice. And most likely they were intoxicated. They were drunk with alcohol. Why do I say that? Well, because right after the, why, right after the episode with Nadab and Abihu, where they offered up strange fire and fire came out from the, throne what represented the tabernacle or the, what represents the throne room of Elohim and killed them on the spot. We see in verse 8, the very next verse, then Yovah spoke to Aaron saying, do not drink wine or intoxicating drink nor your sons when, when you go into the tabernacle of the meeting, lest you die. The implication here because of the juxtaposition of these two passages is that they were drunk. They were not taking their ministerial role seriously. Um, we were we have been very careful. Now I'm not against drinking alcohol, but I don't get drunk. I never have been drunk, and I will never be drunk. So help me, Elohim. I like good wine. We have wine in our Passover seder, and and I like good beer because we have a lot of good microbrew beer in our town. And thankfully, my family doesn't have a proclivity or inclination toward alcoholism. If your family does, there may be a genetic predisposition, and you need to be very careful. Thankfully, nobody on either side of our family, my wife's or our family, we, that wasn't something in our background, thankfully. But I don't get drunk. And I, I, will, and I certainly don't drink alcohol before I go minister. Will not, will not do that. Because I don't, I don't want to do something stupid or that might bring dishonor to Elohim. I walk in the fear of Elohim. And, and shame on any ministers who do that. So, there's, but there's a, a deeper lesson here also. One day, I was, some years ago, I was studying this concept of Nadab and Abihu, and they were drunk. 
and fire came out. Oh, hi, Charity. Good to see you. we got the Philippines joining us. Hallelujah. So I think she has to get up like 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Bless her for her faithfulness. Here in the United States, it's, it's in the afternoon, but uh, there it's in the middle of the morning. They're like ahead of us, time-wise. Anyway, um, there, I believe there is a lesson here, a prophetic lesson. In the end times, what does it say in the book of Revelation? In verse chapter 17. Let's, let's go there. Let's read this. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked to me, saying to me, Come and I will show you the judgments or judgment of the great harlot. The great harlot is a, a system that will exist in the end days. This is a, a metaphor. And usually we're talking about a false religious system who sits on many waters. In other words, has a lot of influence over many people across the face of the earth. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So when you get drunk, what happens? When a person gets drunk... They become, they lose their inhibitions, their, their ability to function correctly, depending on how intoxicated they are. They lose their ability to, to walk and to talk, to, to drive a vehicle. They start saying stupid things. They start acting stupid and they lose control over their faculties to one degree or another. And they, they start doing certain things because their inhibitions come down and their ability to discern between right and wrong, good and evil. You know, I mean, it goes from there. You know how many people lose their, young people lose their virginity because they were at a party and they got drunk. I would say, I don't know, but I would say a, a very large percentage, maybe a majority, because they started drinking alcohol and they got drunk and one thing leads to another. Um, it's huge. Young people don't go there. Don't even get close to that. Determine the boundaries and say, no, I'm not going there because it can lead nowhere good. Don't even hang out with people like this. Don't even think about it. And the same thing is we become careless like Nadab and Abihu and they were probably intoxicated and they did not follow the proper protocols. And Yah dealt with them. And in the end times, people have become careless and loose with the word of Elohim. From the pastors in the pulpit on down. And they become Laodicean. They become carnal. They have become drunk on the things of this world. And they're fornicating with the gods and the and the the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, and they've lost their spiritual edge and their inhibitions have come down, and now they are walking in spiritual compromise. And Yah is going to judge that. He's going to judge individuals and he's going to judge nations that once were Christian nations, loosely speaking, and he's going to judge church systems and religious systems and denominations and leaders with his fire. So this is a call to repentance. And ultimately, all those who do not repent will go into the lake of fire and they will be consumed and they will be lost forever. That's in Revelation chapter 20. So the lesson of Nadab and Abihu is a pretty important one. Now you might say, well, you know, Nathan, we're under grace. We're under grace. We're under the dispensation of grace. So that ain't going to happen to me. Well, may not fire may not come and strike you down immediately, but if you don't repent and you walk in 
in in um, rebellion and dis dis uh, and, and disobedience willfully, you're you're going to be going through some fire. And if it goes, if you totally walk away, and and you're unrepentant, then um, you might end up in the lake of fire. But you say, well, we're under the death dispensation of grace. Well, why don't you go have a little discussion with Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts? They were under the so-called dispensation of grace. And that whole concept of dispensation of grace is a false concept anyway, based on a twisting of the scriptures. All those who have come into relationship with Yeshua, whether it was before the cross or after the cross, are under his grace. Okay? So this whole concept is, is based on a false paradigm, um, a false concept the law is and grace are mutually um, exclusive and are against each other and we've dealt with that before and that's that's based on the, the teachings of Marcion the heretic who lived in the the middle of the second century and we've talked about that we won't go there but go ask Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit lied to the apostles and lied to the Holy Spirit my camera I'm trying to adjust it here. Hey, this is live <laughs> anyway and they got struck down right at the apostles feet and they were in the so-called dispensation of grace also so we want to be very careful about walking in blatant sin because you might drop dead you might die you might not get healed of of something who knows but be very careful. Let's not play with fire. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, let's now get into Leviticus 11. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I just want to... Oh, let me, let's, let's, let's go into Leviticus 10, verse 13. Uh, and then we're going to go into Leviticus 11. Leviticus 10, 13 talks about that the Levites were given a portion of, the, of some of the sacrifices as their due. Uh, Leviticus 10 verse 13 says, and I read, um, well, verse 12, and Moses spoke to Aaron and to Ele Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons who were left, take the grain offering that remains of the offerings made by fire to Yehovah and eat it without, without leaven beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place because it is your due and your son's due. Okay, this is, they didn't have money back in those days. Uh, money, money in the form of coinage didn't come around till about the uh, 7th century BC. Okay? And, um, they, what they did is they would weigh out gold and silver. Um, a shekel be, later became a coin, but in this time, a shekel was weighing out so much, so much silver. Um, and a silver shekel was about the size of a of a nickel, a, a U.S. nickel. I've got some two. I've got a couple two thousand year old shekels around here, and actually, a, a half shekel was about the size, a little smaller than a nickel. And a, a full shekel was about the size of a quarter, or a little bit bigger. Actually, a half shekel was about smaller than a dime, and a, and a, a, a full shekel was the size of about a, a nickel. Anyway, or maybe slightly larger. And they would weigh a certain amount out, but they, there was no medium of exchange. So there would be bartering that would take place, and or you would weigh out so much gold and silver. Well, in this case... The ministers, the Levites, were paid for their service. They, they got to eat of the sacrifice, and they were given other remuneration as well. All that teaches us that those who minister, are worth, they're worthy of, of the support of those that they minister to. And so, this is a biblical concept. And um, if, if a person is being fed spiritually... Then they, um, if it's they need to be giving uh, as Yah leads them, and this this concept is carried over into the New Testament as well, where Paul well says Paul says a workman is worthy of his hire, and that's actually out of the Torah, 
And, um, and Paul didn't really take anything from people. He worked with his own hands, even as I do. Um, and I never took anything because they never gave enough for me to take um, as far as tithes and offerings. So I never took anything anyway. But it is a concept. And, um, uh, and if you want to be blessed, it's important to, to be a giver. Okay, let's go over to Leviticus 11. And we touched on this last week. And I'm just going to very quickly bring this teaching to a close. But the dietary laws in the Bible are ab about separation and holiness primarily and secondarily about health. As I mentioned last week, if you do follow the biblical dietary laws, your health will improve. You're not eating um, the garbage collectors of the ocean and the garbage collectors of the uh, of of the land like pigs and scavengers and that kind of thing uh and you're going to be cutting down the amount of disease and and parasites and things like that that come into your body our bodies are the temple of the holy spirit we got to we want to be very careful what we eat but more importantly throughout chapter 11 and we've talked about this already it's mentioned several times uh, toward the end, verse 44. For I am Yehovah, your Elohim. You shall therefore consecrate yourself, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourself with any creeping thing upon the creeps on the earth, for I am Yehovah, who brings you out of the land of Egypt. To be your Elohim, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the animals and the birds and every living creature that moves in the waters and every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between the clean and the unclean, between animals, the animals that may be eaten and the animals that may not be eaten. So the bigger thing is here, he wants people to be holy as he is holy because he wants relationship with his people and sin and unholiness cannot coexist with Elohim. It's not possible. His fire will burn it and destroy it. The fire of his righteousness and who he is. So, this is why it's very, very important to be very careful what we eat. And the holiness laws, actually, he says, you know, I brought you out of Egypt. You're not you're in the world, but you're not of the world, to quote Yeshua. And when you come out of the world, you don't have to go back into the world because you are my people, and I'm calling you to have a relationship with me, and you can't have one foot in the world and one foot with me. And interestingly enough, the three big areas in this department are the dietary laws, the Seventh-day Sabbath, and the Biblical Feasts. And interestingly, and interestingly enough, these, if you go back and read your um, church history, these are the first three things that the early church fathers got rid of because they were, quote-unquote, too Jewish. They got rid of them. Go read I've got their books up here on my shelf. The early the anti Nicene Church, anti Nicene Church fathers, and they they wax eloquent against these things. Uh, it's not eloquent; it's actually wickedness. And because it was not appealing to the non Jewish Gentiles to have to give up their pork, their holidays. And to stop working on the Sabbath. And the church, the mainstream church has followed this down to the final day. And those of you who have brought your lives into compliance with the seventh day Sabbath and you properly observe it and keep it, and as well as the dietary laws and the feast days, you realize that it's very difficult to fraternize with the world. And I've said many times. All the fun stuff happens on Sabbath in the world, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's the day 
we can't we're not we're not profaning the sabbath by fulfilling the desires of the flesh on that day also the religion the, the the christian holidays and all the other holidays especially christmas and easter and some of the others we don't do those things so we're not hanging out with our family who does those things on those days and then you have the the uh, because we do the feast days and we recognize the pagan implications of the of the um of the other days the, the pagan holidays or the christianized pagan holidays and then you have the dietary laws. You just can't go to potlucks that people have in your neighborhood or in your family or whatever because it's just too much headache to have to try to figure out does this is this jello made with kosher gelatin or or is it pork? You know, is those little things in the in the salad is that are is that crab or is that are those pimentos? <laughs> Is that, was that meat? That looks awfully bloody. Did, did you get the blood out of that before you cooked up that, you know, whatever? And you know the story. Was that sausage? It says, it says beef sausage, but was it made with pork casings? You know, you got to read the labels. It can say beef sausage, but have pork casings. And it goes on and on. It's just too much trouble. So you just pretty much just eat at home. Or you're very careful where you go to eat. You know what I mean? So what that does is that helps us, if you, if you will, it per, or per, almost it's like a fence that prevents us from becoming unholy. Because it's too much trouble to try to deal with these other issues. So we just stay set apart. And hang out with other people of like mind and like faith. Which is not a bad thing. It almost forces us into Torah community. And we can't even eat with our Christian brothers and sisters. They're, they're, they've totally, you know, they're in a different world on that. Because that was all done away with, don't you know? So, as we talked about, I think a little bit last week. This concept of holiness, A, is defined by the Bible and how Yah defines holiness. Number two, it's a lifestyle. Number three, it helps to prevent us from becoming defiled by the world. And we've got to know how the Bible defines holiness and what how the, 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 file, the Bible defines what that which is profane so we can differentiate between the two and take the path of holiness. And when we recognize this and recognize that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to defile it. Suddenly we view ourselves differently. We are no longer just sinners saved by grace, if you will. But we are called to be a holy people. I am not a sinner saved by grace. I, I, I have been saved by grace, and I have been a sinner, but I'm not one walking in sin. I sin, yes, but I'm not walking in sin. The Bible does not say that we're sinners saved by grace. It calls us saints. Set apart ones. The Greek word is hagios. Three categories of people. This is in, uh, I think, 1 Peter 3 or 4. Um, saints or the righteous. Sinners and the ungodly. Well, I'm not a sinner and I'm not ungodly. So that makes me the righteous or, the, or a saint. But I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner saved by grace, but now I'm righteous by his grace. And there's a difference here. So when we recognize that we're called to be a holy, a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood, that's in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, and we represent the kingdom of Elohim. And that radiates through our entire lifestyle. Everything we do, say, and think, what we eat, where we go, what we do. It doesn't make us better than anybody, but it calls us to a higher level. To a higher walk. So that we can have a deeper, more intimate, more anointed relationship with Yehovah Elohim. And now, again, it doesn't make us any better. But we should be thankful. 
that we have, that he's given us the eyes to see and the ears, ears to hear and the heart to obey and to follow that. Hallelujah. That's my teaching on today's Torah portion for today. And thank you for listening. And I hope that um, this encouraged us all to go higher, to go onward and upward in our spiritual walk. Hallelujah.